That front line is the reason why I had to retire. I can't, I, one, I couldn't keep up. <laughs> <laughs> This is North Courts. Thanks for joining us. We've got an exciting show for you today. Javon, we were talking just before the show, so let, let's get right into it. When we're heading to the line off the top, Dylan Brooks, talk to me. Dylan, I think, you know, his play over the last stretch, the, the play in the play-in games, you know, how he started up the 31 points in the, you know, his first playoff game. To me, he just says, you know, speaks volumes to the character and the player that he is. What I'm most impressed about is the fact that he's just so inspirational and motivating to his teammates. I think, you know, I find it so funny. I've seen a lot of people talk about his confidence. I think when Dylan Brooks wakes up, he sees Steph Curry, he sees Kevin Durant, and he sees Dylan Brooks. And you have to appreciate somebody with that amount of confidence. And I think, you know, when you look at what he's been able to do, the player that he's becoming, and you date back to when he was coming out of college and what a lot of NBA scouts said about him, he's defying all those odds. You know, they, they spoke about him not being athletic enough. They, they spoke about him being, you know, somewhat cocky or arrogant. That could be tough for teammates. They spoke about him not being able to defend at this level on the perimeter. And those are all the reasons that we love Dylan Brooks today and love the player that we're getting from him. So, you know, I'm definitely excited for him. And I, I love what I'm seeing from him. I think he's really become a fan favorite over the last couple of weeks. Um, he, he's really a player. He's really becoming a player. I think they got him at discount now when, when you see him play. Hey, no one loves Dylan Brooks more than Dylan Brooks. That's, <laughs> that's what I've seen so far. I mean, that guy's confidence is on another level. And how about the postgame fits with the shades, too? I mean, his swag is just drip all over. Megan, who's your shout out? I mean, can we also give Dylan Brooks the credit for the defensive prowess that he has? Like, he's got a tough assignment nightly um so i just wanted to pick back up off, off of what you both said like he's been doing it this is not just new to the memphis grizzlies fan base like this is not just a playoff situation he's been doing it all season long so i love that we're giving him his flowers uh right now but for me it's got to be kia nurse and it's not necessarily her putting up big gaudy numbers and a big gaudy stat line on a nightly basis it's the fact that she's been able to adapt and adjust into a new system a new coaching staff and a new roster. She's playing with one of the best to ever do it in the legend that is Diana Taurasi. She's playing alongside one of the best bigs in this game and Brittany Griner, and one of the best guards in this game as well too in Skylar Diggins-Smith. And in that trade, I was very excited when I saw that transaction happen. Not necessarily because I was mad she was leaving New York, but for the fact that she is now able to not just shoulder all of the weight of everything and having to be the scorer, the playmaker, the defender, she's got herself in a position where she can just have a role. She can have these big nights, but she can do her role and play within herself. And now also too, with the injury to Diana Taurasi potentially being out for up to four weeks, she could now put herself in a position where she could be the third most important scorer on this team. Some nights, even the second most important, important scorer on this team so it's got to be that that addition to her to that phoenix mercury team and what they've been able to do i was really excited when i saw that transaction happen like i said yeah it's going to be interesting to see how she fills in for those shoes uh, in the short term obviously we will wish the best for diana tarazi don't want to see her out for too long the goat moving on we got some big news for canada andrew wiggins announced his commitment to the team canada national team he will be there for the qualifying tournament. And I mean, hey, at the end of the day, no matter what people say about his game, you take Jamal Murray and Shea Gilgis Alexander out of the picture, he is the best Canada has to offer. And so for him to announce his commitment, that is huge, Javon. I think this does, you know, so many things on different levels. One, you know, before we even get that far, I want to say, you know, he's not going to be the savior. He's not going to, you know, lead us to a, a gold medal right out the gate. I think that's, you know, there's a misconception and that notion has to be changed. That narrative has to be changed because, one, this is international play. There's a lot more than just throwing out, you know, the most talented pieces and just, you know, walking into a gold medal. It's not going to be that. But from when you're looking at Canada basketball, what it does, it says, hey, you know, when you have Murray, when you have, you know, a Wiggins committed to this program, we're starting to change, you know, build chemistry now and build a culture of basketball that's going to be playing on that level for years to come. So I think that that's the biggest message that I got from that. And I think that's what we should be excited about. You know, in addition to what he brings to the table, a 20-point, you know, a 20-point, career 20-point guy in the NBA, 
he's def that's definitely going to roll over into the international play, but it's still going to be a slow process that we need to build on. And, this, and we definitely should be excited about it. To Javon's point, when you think of Andrew Wiggins, like there was that time when I think back to that Mexico City game and, and Venezuela and everything surrounding the men's senior program at the time. We never knew if Andrew was going to play. We never knew if he was committed to the national program. It was always a flip-flop and a guessing game, not just for Canada basketball, but for basketball fans within the country. So the fact that, you know, he finishes the NBA season, albeit we all know that he would have rather been in the first round of the playoffs. We get that. We understand that. But he finishes that in a tough situation and a tough manner. And he turns around and commits to the national program, understanding that he has this, you know, yearning to be able to play and wear the, the Maple Leaf on his chest. And he completely took away all narratives that we would be guessing, is Andrew Wiggins going to play? And that's been the narrative surrounding him as a player for this national program for years, really and truly, since he became a professional. We never knew what was going to happen. So the fact that he answered that question early before we even had to ask him in the off season, if he would be playing in June, I think that's fantastic. And really and truly being able to see what he did with the Warriors this season, I'm very excited to see how he's going to be able to take that and translate it onto the floor in international play because Javon knows this and he said it. International gameplay is much different than NBA gameplay and even EuroLeague and FIBA gameplay. It's a completely different game because you have the best in the world playing for their national programs in all facets. And I'm really excited to see what Andrew's going to bring to the senior men's national team. Again, you mentioned that desire to play in the Olympics. Obviously, that comes from what his mom accomplished uh, at the games uh, during her time. That love runs deep. And for me, looking at Andrew Wiggins, I'm so glad even if he's not in the playoffs, at least people got a glimpse of what he's been doing this season in that play-in game against the Lakers. When you look at the defense that he was playing against LeBron James, when you look at that, that penny fadeaway that he had, I mean, that shows the work that he's been putting in to get to this level. And let's be real. When you look at the criticisms, the narratives that were created in Minnesota, let's face it, the Timberwolves franchise has not been one that serves their players well. I mean, even recent Hall of Fame inductee Kevin Garnett had to get out of that situation. So we have to be real about these things. And now I'm glad in a winning culture, with a winning organization, with a leader like Steph Curry, Draymond Green, Klay Thompson's not playing, but his leadership always stands out. I think we're seeing the real Andrew Wiggins. Now, let's get into a little bit of who's maybe not there yet uh, on that same page in terms of the, having the full commitment. Shea Gilgis Alexander, obviously he was dealing with the plantar fascia and missed pretty much the second half of this season uh, for the OKC Thunder. We don't know yet if he's going to be there. Does his commitment make or break Canada's chances at this qualifying tournament, Javon? Absolutely not. I think you would love to have a guy like Shea, um, a healthy guy like Shea, but at the same time, like I said, international play is completely different, a completely different brand of basketball. And that's the beauty with Canada right now. You have a deep pool of players, a deep talent pool of players. And I think sometimes, you know, with the, with the new wave and the new talent, we're forgetting that we have guys that have experience. A guy like Corey Joseph has been a lifer with this team. And you're going to need that going forward into whether it be, you know, the qualifying tournament or the Olympic play. Then a guy like Kevin Pangos. He's one of the top international point guards in Europe right now. And I think, you know, having that experience bodes well for a team going into international play, into FIBA play. You know, with that being said, if you look at this roster, you could have a roster of, you know, completely NBA guys. I don't think that's the best, I, that, that's the best idea to have, um, you know, a winning chance at the Olympics just because it's a different brand and you need to integrate different styles and guys that understand the play as well. Yeah, Shep. And I think when we talked to Nick Nurse, uh, a couple weeks ago, he, he said that without saying that with regards to when we were asking him about his coaching staff and how his coaching staff has afforded him the ability to focus as head coach of the Toronto Raptors, but also to head coach of the senior men's national team and the amount of work that they're doing behind the scenes that really and truly us in the media, us as basketball fans, we don't actually see because they're doing it behind the scenes. And Nick is the one who gets a lot of the credit and will get all the credit depending on their success. And of course the criticism, should they not have success? I get a email about every other day with the um, stats of everybody from all over the world. So there's kind of a big, big list, long, big, long list, as you know, NBA, uh, college, uh, Europe. 
I watch a lot of NBA games. That's no different than the normal for me. I do tend to stick around a little longer for a game that maybe not be that much interest to my Raptor job. When it comes down to it, it's the coaching staff that will be able to help Nick put together this roster. And I agree with you, Shep. I don't think in this tournament, it's the best idea to put together a team full of NBA guys. I think you need to have a mixture. If you're going to have NBA guys that are available, an Andrew Wiggins, potentially a Dylan Brooks, should he unfortunately not get out of the first round. Sorry, Grizzlies fans. Uh, but I would like to see him continue to get out of the first round at the same time. It's like hit or miss when it comes to this timing right now, guys. Um, you look at a guy like Shea, as you mentioned, Vivek, do we have him play? If he's going to be healthy 100%, I'd love to see him play. But if his health is in question, don't force the kid to play. So I want to see a mixture of guys out of Kevin Pangos, maybe even a Brady Heslip with the way he can shoot the ball. I think having a, a mixture of guys with different experiences, different uh, talent levels and different playing situations when you think of overseas NBA G League, I think that's going to bode well and put Canada in the best position for success come June. That FIBA experience is crucial. And at the end of the day, too, the people who have been putting in the work all this time, you can't leave them out of this moment. Guys like Corey Joseph, Kelly Olenek, Tristan Thompson, they've been putting in the work for years. So you can't just, you know, shove them out of the way for the new guys. What excites me again, Megan, you mentioned the defense of Dylan Brooks earlier. I mean, we've seen him defend. We've seen Andrew Wiggins defend the opposing team's best player. We've seen Lou Dort do that all season. You get those three guys on a court together it's going to be a nightmare for opponents. Oh, most definitely. Like, hello, lockdown, clamp you down, get in your shorts, make it a nightmare of a game for you. And that's what I love about these guys. And I don't know, Shep, if you would agree with me, you've played for the senior men's national team. You've played internationally. I feel like Canadian Hoopers don't get the same level of respect that they actually deserve. And that's what fuels guys like Lou Dortz. Dylan Brooks, Andrew Wiggins, to prove that the narratives that may be surrounding them actually benefit them as players because it pushes them to be better. And you think of a Dylan Brooks, as you mentioned earlier, guys, when he had the narrative of being you know, too confident or too cocky, and it might be difficult for his teammates to play with him. I think that has benefited him because it gives him the confidence to go out and play with a guy like Ja Morant and get it done on both ends of the floor and makes Jaws' ability to play the game a little bit easier. Well, Vivek, to your point, that front line is a reason why I had to retire. I can't, I, one, I couldn't keep <laughs> up. <laughs> but no, Megan, you're right. I think for the longest time, you know, can, Canadians have been seen as the nice guys, you know, the nice, the nice ladies. Now we're at a point where, you know, Dylan is tough as nails. Lou Dora is tough as nails. RJ Barrett is tough as nails. They've shifted that narrative. So I always, I think you have, you know, you're always going to have a chance with these guys. And when you're looking down the future, they're not only talented, they're skilled, um, they're tough, they're gritty. I think now, you know, we're really coming into our own. And this is where not only just, you know, what these guys are doing on the court, but Canada on a whole, we have to come together and support these guys and support our team because that's what they're going up against when they go into the Olympic qualifiers, when they go into Olympic play, is that, you know, a culture of basketball, a culture of supportive basketball. And that's what we need here as well. You got me thinking about that Team Canada commercial where everyone's just saying sorry one after the other. <laughs> Let's move on to the starting five. I mean, in keeping with the playoff theme and Canada putting the world on notice, we decided to focus on five of the best Canadian playoff performances. But we added a little twist because we don't want just Steve Nash and Jamal Murray taking up all the spots. We can pick one performance from one player. For me, I had Steve Nash, that closeout performance in game six against the Dallas Mavericks in 2005. 39 points, 12 assists, nine rebounds. He was incredible in that series. We've all got that series. <laughs> We've got different performances from that series in our list. Jamal Murray in the bubble. I went with that game seven against the Clippers, 40 points, shut it down, sent the Clippers packing. Obviously, we know Twitter had a wild time with that one. We, <laughs> we saw Lugans Dort drop his 30 piece uh, against the Rockets. And then maybe just a couple old school shout outs, Tristan Thompson uh, and Kelly Olenek. Tristan Thompson had a perfect night against the Celtics in 2017. 
20 points, seven for seven shooting, obviously missed a few free throws, but hey, that, that's, that's a heck of a night for him. And then Kelly Olynyk, I think we all remember that night when he went off in the fourth quarter. It was like a three minute stretch where he had 12 points and he finished with 26 on the night in a game seven win over the Wizards in the first round. Megan, who do you have? So you and I have basically the exact same list, except our Jamal Murray performance uh, differs. I have, and this one is near and dear to my heart just because of everything that went on last summer with the WNBA and them dedicating that season to say her name. Um, and as well to what transpired in the US and what the world witnessed with the passing of George Floyd. Um, we're recording this obviously on a Wednesday morning. So when people are seeing this, Tuesday would have been the one year uh, anniversary of his passing and, and his murder. Um, and for me, it was the game six performance from Jamal Murray against the Utah Jazz to force the game seven when he put up 50 points um, wearing the custom made Adidas sneakers, donning the portrait of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. And it wasn't necessarily the performance alone because don't get me wrong, 50 points, nine of 12 from beyond the arc, seven of 24 from the floor period, six assists and five rebounds. That stat line is disgusting, absolutely disgusting. But it was his comments afterwards. Jamal, what, what are you thinking about right now? I just want to win. And in life, you find things that hold value to you, and things to fight for. And we found something we're fighting for as an NBA, as a collective unit. And I usually choose as a, as a symbol to me to keep fighting all around the world. He let his guard down completely, and we don't typically see that from athletes, especially in a post-game interview with Jared Greenberg. And he was emotional and just let it all pour out. And it was what he had to say about why he was wearing those shoes. And, you know, the fact that he realizes, yes, basketball is my job and I get to do this, but there's people that are losing their lives and it needs to change. Just that whole performance encapsulated by that walk-off interview. And then obviously we all saw him walking up the ramp and just, you know, collapsed to his knees to take a moment and just the, the emotion. It was the entire evening for me from Jamal Murray um, and people getting to see a different side of him that we as Canadian fans and Hoops fans have been able to see from him before. So it was the entirety of that game six performance. I remember getting chills after that, just listening to him in that post game and even just hearing you right now, I'm getting those same chills. For me, his whole performance in the bubble there um, is would be one of mine. I, I, I really can't pinpoint one, especially for what he represented, what he's, you know, what he verbalized um, to the world. Uh, after that, I think, you know, I, I got to go with Steve Nash. I think he always killed his uh, his former team, the Dallas Mavericks. My performance, he was 30, he went 34, 12, and 13. Um, that was 2005, and we had we both Dylan Brooks, Dylan Brooks, 31 point performance. Um, you know the most in, in Grizzlies, uh, Grizzlies player debut in playoffs. Lou Dort, obviously the 30 point performance last year. But I think we also we always forget that our our old head in the conversation, Jamal McGore. Um, big you know, cat, wasn't it? Big cat, 17 and 12 versus Philly in 2003. I believe that was also his his All Star, his one All Star year, and I think. You know, he's a guy that's always left out of conversation, but really laid some of the foundation for, you know, this new wave as well. So, uh, yeah, that's our that's our top five. That's my top five. <laughs> and uh, happy belated birthday to the big, big cat too. He just, uh, well, I'm not gonna say his age, but uh, we'll, we'll <laughs> but hey, we'll we'll relive uh, some of those fond he's memories. Twenty five. Yeah. <laughs> so that's gonna wrap it up for this episode. Make sure you hit us up with your favorite performances by a Canadian in the NBA playoffs. And for now, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. Join us again in a couple of weeks. Thanks so much for watching.